Welcome to Lecture 10, Air Masses, Fronts, and Middle Latitude Cyclones. So in this chapter, uh, in the book, Chapter 8, and this is Lecture 10, we will examine typical weather associated with cold fronts and warm fronts. We will be addressing questions such as, why are cold fronts usually associated with showery weather? How can, how can warm fronts in the winter cause freezing rain and sleet to form over a vast area? And how can one read the story of an approaching warm front by observing clouds? So we'll also see how weather fronts are an integral part of a middle, middle latitude cyclonic storm or middle latitude cyclone for short. But first, so that we can better understand fronts and middle latitude cyclonic storms, we need to understand air masses. We will look at how and where they form and the type of weather usually associated with them. So an air mass is an extremely large body of air whose properties of temperature and humidity are fairly similar in any horizontal direction at any altitude. So air masses are large three-dimensional bodies of air and the temperature and humidity properties are pretty similar um, at any particular altitude in any horizontal direction. And usually air masses are associated with some kind of pressure system. Now different air masses have different densities. Some are warm air masses, so the density is lower than those that are colder air masses, which therefore have higher densities. Because recall, warm air is less dense, cold air is more dense. And air masses may cover thousands of square kilometers um, and be on the order of 10 kilometers high in the vertical direction. So let's look at an example of an air mass um, by looking at a surface weather map. This is figure 8.1 in the book, showing a large, extremely cold winter air mass dominating the weather over much of the United States, especially the eastern half. At almost all of the cities, the air is cold and dry. So the way to read this is to um, look at the numbers and see that the numbers in the upper left, the numbers in the upper left here for these, uh, these circles, okay, the numbers to the upper left of the circles are the temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit. And the numbers in the bottom left relative to the circles are the dew point in degrees Fahrenheit. And the circles show you cloud coverage. Um, if the circle is unfilled, it's a clear circle, that means the skies are clear. If it's half filled, okay, that means partly cloudy skies. If it's completely filled, that means overcast skies, okay, cloudy skies. And Note that although the surface air temperature and dew point vary somewhat, okay, almost everywhere the air is cold and dry, okay, with the exception of the zone of snow showers on the eastern shores of the Great Lakes, shown by these asterisk and uh, triangles, okay. So just um, look at this weather map and you'll see these temperatures are very cold. Okay, um, now there, again, there's some variation, but these are quite cold temperatures, right? 14 degrees Fahrenheit in uh, Amarillo, Texas. Okay, 10 degrees Fahrenheit here in Western uh, Arkansas. 16 degrees Fahrenheit here in Northwest of uh, New Orleans, right? That's really cold for that region. Even 27 degrees Fahrenheit here in uh, Northern Florida nine degrees Fahrenheit here in northwestern Georgia, okay, 25 degrees Fahrenheit here in near Charleston, South Carolina, 28 degrees Fahrenheit near Charlotte, North Carolina, okay, 
And then as you go into the northeast, temperatures get even colder, right? You're in the minus teens, okay, for these locations in uh, um, Vermont and Maine, okay? And again, like we were saying, almost everywhere the air is dry. And the way to see that is, one, look at how um, most of the locations have the open circles, meaning clear skies, right? So it's dry in the sense that there's no clouds. And also the dew points are low. Remember how dew point is a measure of how much water vapor is in the air? Higher the dew point, the more water vapor in the air. Well, since these dew points are so low, that means the air is very dry, okay? Now this blue H here, centered over northern Mississippi, is a region of high pressure. It's an anticyclone, okay? You'll notice how as you go toward it from all directions, the uh, isobar values increase, okay? So this anticyclone will drift eastward over time, carrying with it the temperature and moisture characteristics of the region where the air mass formed. In a day or two, cold air will be located over the central Atlantic Ocean. So part of weather forecasting is a matter of determining air mass characteristics, predicting how and why they change, and in what direction the systems will move. Now, in order for a huge mass of air to develop uniform characteristics, it's, it needs a source region. Um, it needs a region to form, okay? So source region is a region where the air mass forms. And the source region should generally be flat and of uniform composition with light surface winds. Um, if the winds are too strong at the surface, then it can be hard for the, um, a large body of air to settle and, and, and a large body of air to take um, on similar temperature and humidity properties, okay? longer the air remains stagnant over its source region, or the longer the path over which the air moves, the more likely it will acquire properties of the surface below. So ideal source regions are usually those areas dominated by surface high pressure, including the ice and snow covered Arctic plains in winter and subtropical oceans in summer. Now the middle latitudes, um, where we are in California, where the uh, continent of the United States is, have surface temperature and moisture characteristics varying considerably, um, and therefore are not good source regions for air masses. Instead, the mid-latitudes is a region where um, there's a transition, okay, where air masses with different physical properties move in, clash, and produce an exciting array of weather activity. So air masses do not usually form over the continental United States, but they can move over the continental United States from the north and from the south. And the, as we'll see later, the boundary between two air masses with differing uh, temperature and humidity properties is called a front. And that those fronts are associated with uh, weather, exciting weather. So source regions are the regions where air masses originate. And again, they should be flat and of uniform composition with light surface winds. Now, air masses are usually classified according to their temperature and humidity, again, both of which usually remain uniform in any horizontal direction. There are cold and warm air, ma air masses, humid and dry air masses, Air masses are grouped into five general categories according to their source region shown in table 8.1, okay? So you see the source region can be either over land or water. Air masses with a source region over land are called continental. And that's the first word in their name, continental. And that, that can be abbreviated with a small c whereas air masses forming over water are called maritime, that's the first word in their name, and they are designated with a small m. Now, 
these land, these continental and maritime air masses can form at um, different latitude regions. Continental air masses can form over the Arctic. If so, they are given the abbreviation small c or lowercase c, capital or uppercase a. Okay? They are extremely cold, dry, and stable because they're so cold. And they usually form over ice and snow covered surfaces, which reflect a lot of sunlight. And that's why those regions are so cold. Now there's air masses that form over polar regions. So in the Northern hemisphere, th these are not, the latitudes of polar regions are not quite as high as the Arctic. Okay, the Arctic is near the North Pole, um, the region surrounding it basically. And polar regions are still cold, they're still high latitudes, but not quite as extreme in terms of temperature. Okay, so continental polar air masses, small c or lowercase c, uppercase p air masses are cold, dry, and stable. There are also air masses that form at the polar latitudes over water. They're called maritime polar air masses, lowercase m, uppercase p, and they're cool, not as cold as continental polar air masses, because remember, um, in the winter time, it's colder over land than water, okay? And they're moist, though, because they form over water and there's a lot, there's a lot of evaporation over the water, even if it's cool. And so they actually are unstable um, because of the, they're, they're not as cold, they're cool, and they're moist. And they actually can be unstable, especially because the water uh, over the polar regions can be warmer than the air above it. Okay, so remember, if you have a um, warmer surface, right, if you have air above that's cooler than the surface, that can produce instability. Okay. There are, on the other um, uh, hand, there are air masses that form over the tropics, okay, the lower latitudes, continental tropical air masses, given with the abbreviation lowercase c, uppercase t, are hot, dry, and have stable air aloft, but unstable surface air, okay? So these are hot because they form over the tropics, and they're because they form over land over the tropics, they're pretty dry. Whereas maritime tropical air masses, given with the abbreviation lowercase m, uppercase t, are warm, not as hot because they form over water, okay? And moist, since they form over water, and they're forming over warm water, so there's a lot of evaporation over the warm water of the tropics, and they are usually unstable. So these are the five primary air mass types, depending on two variables, temperature and humidity. Continental Arctic, continental polar, continental tropical. Those are the three air masses forming over continental regions, and the two air masses forming over water are maritime polar and maritime tropic. And again, the two variables that um, determine the, to describe the air masses are temperature and humidity. This is figure 8.2, showing air mass source regions and their paths. So notice continental Arctic air mass forms over the Arctic, okay? very high latitudes, okay? And it tends to move south or southeast. Continental polar air mass forms over western Canada and eastern Alaska. It generally moves south to southeast. We have maritime polar air masses forming over the um, northern pacific north central pacific ocean as well as uh, the north far north atlantic ocean now while the polar maritime polar continental polar continental arctic air masses tend to move um, with at least one component toward the south okay the um the maritime this maritime polar air mass that originates here moves southwest over the Atlant the one that forms over the Atlantic, whereas the maritime polar air mass over the Pacific moves southeast. The tropical air masses tend to move um, northerly, okay? 
So the maritime, this maritime tropical air mass forms over the uh, equi um, uh, low latitudes of the uh, uh, Pacific, um, tropical Pacific Ocean, the Northern Hemisphere, will move toward the north. And there's a maritime tropical air mass that can form over the Gulf of Mexico um, and move into the Gulf states, as well as the plains and the Midwest. Okay. It can get very warm and humid in the summertime for this region of the country. Okay, Hot temperatures and high dew points making it feel um, hotter than it really is. There's also the maritime tropical air mass forming off the coast of Florida and the Carolinas, and it can slide toward the northwest okay, into the eastern this east, uh, region of the eastern U.S. Okay. Continental tropical air mass that forms over northern Mexico and southern um, south central U.S. generally only forms in the summertime when it gets hot enough. Okay, so after the air mass spends some time over its source region, it usually begins to move in response to the winds in the upper levels. Now, as it moves away from its source region, it encounters surfaces that might be warmer or colder than itself. When the air mass is colder than the underlying surface, it's warmed from below which produces instability at low levels. And in this case, convection, increased convection and turbulent mixing um, near the surface usually result in good visibility. The air gets mixed out. Uh, cumuliform clouds like cumulus, cumulus congestus, even cumulonimbus, and some showers of either rain or snow depending on the time of year. On the other hand, when the air mass is warmer than the surface below, okay, so the surface below is colder, the lower layers of the atmosphere are chilled by contact with the cold earth. Warm air above cold air produces stable air with little, little vertical mixing, and that can cause dust, smoke, and other pollutants to accumulate and reduce surface visibility. In moist air, um, stratiform clouds like nimbostratus, altostratus may form, and there can be some drizzle or fog associated with them. We are now in a position to study the formation and modification of these air masses and the variety of weather that accompanies them. So the bitterly cold weather that invades southern Canada and the United States in wintertime is associated with continental polar and even continental Arctic air masses. These air masses originate over the ice and snow covered regions of the Arctic, northern Canada, and Alaska where long, clear nights allow for strong radiational cooling of the surface. Air in contact with the surface becomes quite cold and stable. Since little moisture is added to the air and the air is so cold, it's quite dry. Eventually, a portion of this cold air can break away and under the influence of the winds aloft, it can be carried southward as an enormous, shallow, high pressure area shown in this figure, figure 8.3 in the book. So this is a situation where a shallow but large dome of extremely cold air, a continental Arctic air mass, moves slowly southeastward across the upper plains. The leading edge of the air mass is marked by a cold front. Numbers represent air temperatures. So notice here over um, interior Canada, you have a temperature of minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? But it's warmer, significantly warmer to the south of that uh, continental polar air mass. Now, as the cold air moves into the interior plains of the US, there are no topographic barriers to restrain it. So it continues southward, bringing with it frigidly cold temperatures. As the air mass moves over warmer land to the south, that does moderate the temperature of it somewhat. But even in the, during the afternoon, where the surface air is most unstable due to heating during the daytime, absorption of sunlight by the surface and heating, Cumulus clouds are rare because this air mass is so dry, okay? And at nighttime, when the winds die down, rapid radiational cooling of the surface and clear skies produce very low minimum temperatures. If this cold air moves as far south as central or southern Florida, the um, wintertime vegetable crops can be damaged significantly. And when this cold, dry air moves over a relatively warmer body of water, like the Great Lakes here, 
Heavy snow showers called lake effect snow showers often form on the eastern shores. Here is a figure from the book, figure 8.4, showing average upper level wind flows, shown by the purple heavy arrows, and surface positions of anticyclones, high pressure systems, associated with two extremely cold outbreaks of Arctic air during December time, one in December of 1990, one in December of 1989. The numbers on the map represent some of the minimum temperatures um, recorded during this cold snap. So what you see is incredibly low temperatures for much of um, the country, okay, associated with these two cold air outbreaks. The one that happened in 1990, late uh, December of 1990, uh, really produced some cold temperatures in the western third of the U.S., okay? So look at some of these temperatures in places that are not accustomed to seeing this type of uh, um, cold, okay, 23 degrees Fahrenheit uh, near Ukiah, okay, 20 degrees Fahrenheit here in um, near San Luis, Bis San Luis Obispo, 21 degrees Fahrenheit in Los Angeles, okay, and then as you go away from the coast, okay, you look at some of these temperatures over Montana, minus 38 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 34 degrees Fahrenheit, Idaho, minus 29 degrees Fahrenheit. These are extremely cold temperatures. Now, the cold air outbreak that happened a year later, in late, uh, sorry, a, a year earlier, in late December of 1989, had even colder temperatures associated with it. You see temperatures of uh, minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, more de minus 47 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper plains, okay? And it brought extremely cold temperatures all the way down to the Gulf Coast, 11 degrees Fahrenheit south of New Orleans, um, 14 degrees Fahrenheit here in along the uh, Gulf of Mexico on the Texas coast, even 18 degrees Fahrenheit here near Corpus Christi, Texas, at the near the border of the U.S. and Mexico. Okay, so very cold temperatures, unprecedented cold temperatures. Even in Florida, 22 degrees Fahrenheit in Orlando, 31 degrees Fahrenheit in Miami. Okay, so this first cold air outbreak, um, sorry, the, the one that happened a year later, the one shown that brought the uh, cold air temperatures to um, regions farther west, caused $300 million in damage to vegetables and citrus crops along the west coast in December of 1990. Temperatures in parts of California plummeted to their lowest readings in more than 50 years. Now, usually the Rocky Mountains, the Sierra Nevada, and the Cascades um, protect the Pacific Northwest, uh, including the states of Oregon and Washington, from the onslaught of polar, continental polar air and continental Arctic air. But occasionally, very cold air masses do invade these regions. When the upper level winds over Washington and Oregon blow from the north or northeast on a trajectory from northern Canada or northern um, or Alaska, cold air can actually slip over the mountains, which usually act as topographic barriers, and extend its icy fingers all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Okay. Now, as the air moves off the high plateau, over the mountains into the lower valleys, there is compressional heating that happens, okay, as air sinks, it warms. And that causes temperatures to rise so that by the time it does reach the lowlands of Oregon and Washington or on the coast, it is considerably warmer than originally, okay, but no way would it necessarily be considered warm, okay. Here is a figure figure 8.5 from the book showing modification of continental polar air as it moves over warmer bodies of water, the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean, okay? So you have cold, dry continental polar air moving um, here, shown by this arrow, south of the Gulf Coast in, over the Gulf of Mexico. And what's happening is it's moving over a warm body of water with evaporation. So you have colder, drier air above a warm body of water. And that's forming showers. 
it's actually forming rows of cumulus clouds you see here see these rows of cumulus clouds forming parallel to northerly surface winds okay as the air continues its journey southward into mexico and central america strong moist northerly winds build into heavy clouds and showers along the um, northern coast okay and hence a once cold dry and stable air mass can be modified to such an extent that its original characteristics are no longer discernible when this happens the air mass is often given a new designation so by the time it reaches um, the Yucatan Peninsula and um, uh, mainland Mexico here it could be maritime tropical okay and also uh, showers can be conforming as continental polar air moves over the um, Atlantic Ocean because there is a warm ocean current um, that flows along the east coast okay figure 8.6 shows clouds um, and the airflow aloft associated with maritime polar air moving into california the large l shows the position of the upper level low Regions experiencing precipitation are shown. Um, you see these uh, locations with two uh, filled in circles. They're experiencing light rain. Three circles represents moderate rain. The upside down triangles show showers. And there are some higher elevation regions experiencing snow showers shown by the um, asterisk and upside down triangles. Okay, there's even a thunderstorm here. The small white clouds over the uh, open ocean are cumulus clouds forming the conditionally unstable air mass. Okay, so North American maritime polar is cool, moist, and unstable. This is figure 8.7 um, in your book. It's figure 11.8 in a similar book. And it shows how after crossing several mountain ranges, cool, moist uh, maritime Pacific air from off the Pacific Ocean is modified into relatively drier air, okay? So you have maritime polar air here moving from west to east, it's cool and moist. And as it rises up the Olympic Mountains here, this is Olympic Mountains are in Western Washington moisture condenses out right as air rise it cools as it cools condensation happens and that forces uh, water vapor to condense out which reduces the amount of moisture in the air and precipitation can happen and as remember how as the air sinks down the leeward side of the mountain it warms due to compression relative humidity decreases as it goes over several mountain ranges the olympic mountains the cascade mountains the rocky mountains by the time it reaches the plains okay it descends over the eastern rocky mountains into the plains of the u.s it's um it's been modified it's warmer and drier okay than originally so it's lost its characteristics this figure 8.8 .8 from your book shows winter and early spring surface weather pattern that usually prevails during the invasion of cold moist maritime polar air into the mid-atlantic and new england states the green shading represents light rain and drizzle these commas two commas together represent uh, drizzle the pink shaded region represents freezing rain and sleet well, the white shaded area shows snow okay a slow moving cold anticyclone shown by this blue age um, drifting toward the east causes a northeasterly flow of cold moist air into the region south of it into the new england states now the boundary separating this invading colder air from warmer air even farther south is marked by a stationary front they have cold maritime polar air cold damp air on the northern side of the stationary front and we'll learn more about fronts um, 
later in the lecture. And you have maritime tropical warm moist air to the south. Okay. North of the front, northeasterly winds generally pr provide undesirable weather. Okay, it's, the air is damp and there's low thick clouds from which light precipitation falls in the form of rain, snow, or drizzle. When ap upper atmospheric conditions are right, mid-latitude cyclonic storms can actually form, they can actually develop along this stationary front here, um, uh, draped over the Carolinas, move eastward, intensify. And actually, they can eventually uh, form nor'easters. Okay, we'll look at that later. Here's figure 8.9 from the book showing an infrared satellite image which illustrates maritime tropical air, a stream of it, moving into Northern California on January 1st, 1997. So you see this band of clouds here. This is uh, maritime tropical air that is moving all the way from north of Hawaii into California. So it's very warm and moist. And this um, stream of moisture from the tr subtropics that moves all the way into California is called the Pineapple Express, or in more recent years, it's been called an atmospheric river. So a Pineapple Express or atmospheric river is basically a very um, long body of moisture, okay? Uh, warm, moist air associated with moisture that moves from typically near Hawaii into the um, western region of the U.S., especially California. And when this happens, it can produce very high precipitation totals, okay? And it can produce flooding. This particular Pineapple Express produced heavy rain, extensive flooding in northern and central California. Also, uh, cl mudslides closed roads. Um, there was flooding that sent people fleeing from their homes. Yosemite National Park actually had to close for more than two months due to the flooding there. Figure 8.10 from your book shows weather conditions during an unseasonably hot spell in the eastern portion of the United States that occurred between the 15th and 20th of April 1976. The surface low and pressure area and fronts are shown for April 17th. Now numbers to the east of this surface low centered over the Missouri-Iowa border are um, in red are maximum temperatures recorded during the hot spell, while those to the west of the low in blue are minimum temperatures recorded during the same time period. And the heavy purple arrow is the average upper level flow during the period. Okay, so um, there was a trough, a large trough over the western half of the U.S., and there was a strong ridge over the eastern half of the U.S., basically. Okay, the, the purple L represents the upper level low aloft, upper level trough, and the purple H represents the upper level ridge. And this is an amazing figure to look at because it illustrates how in April there can be um, basically both winter and summertime, okay? In, you know how in April, the, it, in a certain location, right, it can alternate between what feels like winter and summer, okay? I've seen that in San Jose this April, where some days it might struggle to reach the low 60s, and it's windy, and it's raining, and other days it's in the upper 70s, it's clear, okay, shorts and t-shirt weather, right? But this figure shows how in April the eastern half, especially eastern third of the U.S., was baking in summertime heat, um, and it was humid too. It was mar there was a maritime tropical air mass over the eastern third of the U.S., so the northeast, the southeast, the Midwest, while the western half of the country was experiencing bitterly cold temperatures. Okay, so take a look. Thirty-six. Look at some of these minimum temperatures in April. Okay, early springtime. Um, early to mid springtime, right? Mid to late April of 1976, 36 degrees Fahrenheit in Los Angeles, 
right? It rarely gets into the, to the 30s in LA, let alone in April. 32 degrees Fahrenheit in San Diego, okay? Look at some of these temperatures over Utah, 16 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Upper, mid to upper 20s over northern Arizona, northern New Mexico, okay? So very cold air over the western half of the U.S., right? And then look at the temperatures in April over the eastern half, eastern third, especially the U.S., 94 in New York City, 96 in Boston, okay? Um, it's rare for New York City to reach the upper 90s, okay? You've heard how it's hot. You may have heard it's hot and humid in New York City. It is, um, and the humidity, all the moisture in the air kind of actually limits the warming okay dry regions warm more during the summertime so this is kind of the, the hottest it can get in new york city in terms of the temperature and it's happening in april okay it doesn't get in the upper 90s too often in new york but this 94 degrees fahrenheit would feel a lot hotter because it was associated with high humidity okay so it might feel like it's in the 100s and um so you see some of these extending into Maine, low 90s. In fact, it was hotter in parts of the northeast, mid to upper 90s, than parts of the southeast. You see the upper, mid to upper 80s over some of the southeastern states for high temperatures for Alabama, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, okay, Tennessee, North Carolina, okay. So this figure illustrates the strong difference in temperatures between these two air masses, continental polar air mass and a maritime tropical air mass. Figure 8.11 in your book shows maximum uh, temperatures in a stretch of mid-July during 2005 when there was a continental tropical air mass covering a large area of the southwestern U.S. and extending into the um, northwestern and north uh, central U.S. too. Um, the large H shows uh, the uh, high pressure area that was centered over the southwestern U.S. And you'll look at some of these maximum high temperatures and see they were extremely high. Okay, so 113 degrees Fahrenheit in Reading, 105 degrees Fahrenheit in Medford, 109 degrees Fahrenheit in Fresno, 125 degrees Fahrenheit in Needles, California, 117 degrees Fahrenheit in Vegas. Okay, and basically the western half of the country was had um, during this time period experienced temperatures of if not 100 plus degrees upper 90s right even in east northeastern washington and northern montana okay and the um unusual characteristic of this heat wave is that it lasted so long okay usually um heat waves don't last more in the especially in the western u.s don't last more than a few days okay if if you have one or two days of really high temperatures that's not a long enough period to say there's a heat wave it's needed to last a few days but it usually doesn't last more than four or five days okay but this heat wave lasted for over a week okay so that was a big deal because the heat can you know wear on people more and more as it as it continues right and of course a heat wave lasting that long would put a lot of um, stress on the energy grid, okay? Fresno, by the way, had six consecutive days of 110 plus degrees Fahrenheit temperatures during this event. Okay, now that we understand the characteristics of these five major air masses, we are in a position to start looking at fronts which are boundaries between the air masses of different temperatures and humidities. And fronts are, can be associated with exciting weather, such as thunderstorms, showers, okay, different precipitation types.